All right. At the time of the recording of this interview, Tommy Kufetos is releasing his first solo album with his new project called Tommy's Rock Trip. The album is called Beat Up by Rock and Roll. Welcome, Tommy, to the show. Hey, how you doing, Eddie? Um, thank you for having me. Uh, and I hate the term solo album because that just sounds so horrible. It's just me and my buddies making a rock and roll album, which we made in a barn. So you can't get much more rock and roll than that. For that, is, that is true. That is true. Um, how excited and how different has this release been for you versus some of the things you've done in the past? Different because I was in charge. I put the band together. I wrote the songs. I wrote the lyrics. I made made the melodies. Um, I kind of guide guys on how I want it played and the style that I wanted and the attack that I wanted. And it was different because it was recorded 110% live. We didn't nice. even use headphones. We didn't use headphones. We didn't use cutting and pasting we didn't use click tracks oh, we just awesome. faced, faced the amps at each other and they heard my drums and we said record and we got the whole song from the first note to the last note in one take see and that's amazing because that's not really done that much anymore everything is pro tools this. it's not it's not First of all, it's not amazing. It's what it should be. Musicians should be able to play from the beginning to the end. True. But True. it hasn't, you know, it's been, it's been, I think, I think people are, yes, Pro Tools great for some things, our computers great for some things, but yes, but now it's kind of becoming like a convenience thing, you know, yeah. and I didn't I didn't want to have any of that come into play. It's, you know, they were literally saying, oh, my ar arm hurts. And I'm saying, good, your arm should hurt. Yeah, my arms is... hurt too. My arms, have been, my arms have been hurting for 30 years. That's part of the gig. Yeah, hell yeah. This is rock and roll. You know exactly. I mean? uh, and I wanted, to, I wanted to ask you because you got Eric Dover on this record. And <clears> I love <throat> Eric. You know what I mean? Like from Slash's Snake Pit, everything he's done. Um, how did you guys hook up for this project like how did this come about well i offered him an extremely large amount of money and he <laughs> couldn't turn it down so no i i've, I've known eric for a long time no now when i uh, joined alice cooper's band we played with alice cooper together and mm -hmm. i always uh, admired his musicality and his um he kind of has the wild side to him, especially back then. He was a little more wild. And I like that kind of side because I'm not that wild, but I like my music wild. So he yeah. brought that energy I wanted to the music. Okay. Um, I want to ask you, how much, because I'm trying to get, when did, you, when did this become a reality? Like Tommy's Rock Trip. When... Because the pandemic and everything happening and obviously Ozzy having the injury uh, gave you guys a lot of time off. When did this Tell start? me about it. It started during this worldwide shutdown when music got shut down and somebody said, do you want to make a record? And I had never made a record. I'd never written a song. I'd never written lyrics. I'd never put a band together. I never rehearsed it under my own... Um, God, if you will. And I said, you know what? I'm a musician. I make music. So why not? And I kind of looked at it as a challenge for myself because I'd never done these things. Um, I wanted to see if I could maybe write some of my own music. And then if I could write my own music, would I like it? You know, because I have such high standards for music and there's a certain style that I enjoy when it comes to rock and roll. I like, I like it tight. I like it to rock, yeah. meaning there's got to be a certain energy for me to consider it rock and roll. It, it has to have a certain standard. And being from Detroit, I hold those standards very high. You know, the music from there is driving. Yeah. It has a pulsation. It's, yeah. you know, and Boston is the same way. It's like a lot of people think Jay Giles is a Detroit band because they played that or still, I mean, Peter, 
Peter Wolf, he's still a rocker, you know. They yeah, always still thought, kicking ass. They always thought they were from a from Detroit, but you know, and Aerosmith, you know, they're very yeah. Detroit, but Boston and Detroit are very similar, you know, in their yep. in their rootsy rock and roll approach. So I wanted to take not copying those bands, but but taking the influence that I've in the approach that I've learned from those bands and spirit. do it, do it in my own music. You know, it doesn't sound like Jay Giles at all. No, and, no, no, no. But, but, but we could play on the same bill and it would make perfect sense. I agree because listening to this record, I was sitting there trying to figure out all the different influences on it. Cause I was like, Oh man, I can hear this and I can hear uh, like, for example, right, I could be wrong. I want you to correct me on this. I hear... I probably will correct you. I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, I hear a little bit of, like, Aerosmith um, when I was listening to Heavy Load. I don't know why. I got that kind of spirit and feel okay. to it. Okay. Okay. Um, That's. I mean, I, I love that you hear that. I don't hear Aerosmith on that track. But okay. but get bring it on, baby. All right. I hear a little Deep Purple in... You got the cash. I got the flash. I, I would. It's... I would agree with. I would agree with that. And I almost didn't want to put some organ on that because of yeah. that. But then I said. But then I said, screw it. Put I... it on anyways. Who yeah. cares? And 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 my thing is like what Doug Organ does on that was absolutely amazing. His 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 organ. Yeah, there's only there's only some little patches on there. It's not really there's a cool little organ solo on "Make Me Smile," but that's the only two songs that he actually plays on. Okay. You know, it's really just a little cor chord pattern pattern underneath. Um, Got gotcha. you. Okay. But the 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 driving rhythm is kind of where it's at on that one. Definitely. All right. That um, that riff that 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 guitar riff is very Richie Blackmore. Yeah. And it kicks ass. Like I honestly like listening to it. I'm like, it. the The great thing about it is it doesn't sound outdated. It sounds like this is something that needs to be out right now. You know what I mean? Well, it it is. I know, and it is, and it is, yeah. and and I thank you for that because like I felt like there's not enough of this kind of music. Like I feel like like bands like Motorhead are gone, you know, and there's not enough of that. You know what I mean? Like just good they're, old rock they're and They're all roll. gone. And they're they're all gone. And I've been so blessed to play with older people. I feel like I'm a the last of a dying breed, if you will. I'm connected yeah, no because I've played with older guys. So I I live in the past, but but to me that past is the future. That's how music is supposed to be played. Yeah, you know, there's not a lot of even my age. I'm 41 now, and and people my age they're into a whole different rock trip if you will they're in a whole different trip than i am that's why i called it tommy's rock trip because this is my trip this is my yeah. take on what i think rock and roll is it's not like you know heavy metal i don't like that term to me this music is not heavy metal at all it's 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 rock and roll to me you know and that can be many different things but it does it doesn't have to be evil to be rock and roll. I think, True. I think this record is fun. It sounds like summer. It sounds like chicks in bikinis and it sounds yeah. like, you know, people drinking beers and having a good time. I agree. You know, and, 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 and enjoying life, you know? Yeah, no, I agree. I agree 100%. I was, uh, there was a comment you made in, a, in an interview and I couldn't like, I was sitting there like, man, I couldn't agree more with him. You were talking about how, the feeling of rock and roll being dangerous was kind of gone. You know what I mean? And I can remember being a kid yeah. and seeing Guns N' Roses Welcome to the Jungle for the first time, right? The music video. Yeah, that's funny you say that. I remember seeing that as a kid. I remember seeing the video on MTV. Yeah. And walking in, my, my dad had this buddy named Chaz, and he was like a single guy, and he lived the single life. And MTV was on, he had like pictures of naked chicks on his wall <laughs> and stuff like that. Yeah. And Welcome to the Jungle came on, and I remember sitting in front of the TV, like being semi-scared and intrigued. I wasn't the world's biggest Guns N' Roses fan. They're no, no, fan, no. But I just remember watching that video and hearing the music, and it, I was like, whoa, this is, this is wild. Yeah. You know? it, it gave me that sense of reckless abandoned danger, yes. you know, which was, yes. it, it intrigues you. What the hell is this? Is yeah. a great thing. 
And you're almost like, man, I don't think I want to go to Hollywood anymore. Like, do I, am I going to run into those guys? It, it, right. You know what I mean? Right. Like, and I, I mean, and, and imagine like, imagine little Richard back in the fifties, how dangerous he was, yeah, let alone even yeah. in the eighties. I mean, that's some dangerous shit. Yeah. As far as I'm concerned, that's the, Agreed. that's the nth degree of dangerous. They blow that blows guns and roses out the water and danger oh, factor. I agree. You know? I agree. 100%. It's just so edgy and against the grain. And that's what on top of being great music and the attack of that music, because that's my favorite stuff. Yeah, yeah. That Little Richard, that Chuck Berry, um, all that kind of stuff. You know, people consider it oldies, but it, but it wasn't always oldies. It was the cut. It, it was the invention of rock and roll. And people yeah. forget that, you know, out in California here, as much as Motorhead was cool and Lemmy and all this kind of stuff. And there's statues to Lemmy and people post pictures of Lemmy. I don't see that kind of stuff about Chuck Berry. To me, is unfortunate. I got I got Chuck Berry. Only, to me, he is the god of rock. As far yeah, as I'm yeah, concerned, yeah. nobody was dangerous, more dangerous than that guy and unpredictable and, and edgy in their music and, and creative. And so I wanted to take, you know, these guys had a cadence and a style and a pulse to their music. And I just wanted to try to get a slight iota of that into my rock. You know, it doesn't yeah, compare yeah. to it at all. It never will. But that's what I love. And that's my approach. And if anybody can hear that in there a little bit, then I accomplished my goal. I definitely did. I definitely heard that in the, in the record. It was uh, the last two tracks. I remember thinking, man, this is like good old like rock and roll. It had that feel like the Chuck Berry, Little Richard, you know, that kind of stuff. Even yeah, like, I mean, to me, go ahead. No, I was going to say even like, you know, guys like Jerry Lee Lewis, you know, like just great rock and roll. Absolutely. That's the, that's the foundation, should be the foundation of it all to me. But yeah. I'm an old fogey. So what do yeah, I Yeah, but you know what, though? If if you hear interviews with Lemmy, the one guy Lemmy always, Absolutely. always mentioned was Absolutely. Chuck Berry. You Absolutely. Know I mean? You know what? I, I talked to Lemmy one time at a club, and he was very nice. And we talked about this stuff for about an hour. Yeah. This was kind of before, nonstop. He knew we were finishing their sentences. You know, he, he knew all the old clips of Jerry Lee Lewis in the seventies that I was talking about and he oh, knew okay. everything. So that's why his music was so cool. And Motorhead yeah. had a style because he had the foundation there, yep, yep. you know, and that's kind of exactly what I'm talking about. He took it and he made it his own, but he knew how to grind up there on stage, of you know, course. which black music grinds, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And they, and a lot of those artists, Jay Giles, I mean, I mean, that's all it's black music, but it's, but it's white, but it's perfect, you know? Yeah, yeah. You know, well, I was white gonna say kind of added the pop and a little bit of, a little bit of different kind of, you know, country mixed in there and all the kind yeah. of things yeah. It made for the white version of it. And it's, it, and that's also a beautiful thing, you know? True, true. But like you said before, like not a lot of those guys get a lot of credit. You know what I mean? Like a lot of them, there's tons of artists that got pushed under, you know, the rug and made way for these other artists you know to to explode you know yeah well it was timing and, and and you know i mean but all the greats well were all the greats whether it's the rolling stones or acdc or aerosmith or ted nugent or or anybody they will say they invented it and they were the architects my true, point being true. is i don't think you know, and I'm talking about artists from the 60s and 70s, you know, when rock, the heavy rock thing was at its peak. I'm saying I don't think that carried over in the 80s and the 90s and the 2000s. No. I think people lost their footsteps of of not doing their homework, I think. I also maybe you'll agree with me on this. Maybe I think. When it came to the 90s, I think the sense of the rock star sort of got lost because a lot of well, grunge, absolutely. a lot of grunge, like as much as I, you know, love and appreciate that music for what it is and what it did at the time, I feel like they took away that sense where it was almost like to be ashamed to be a rock star. 
Well, yeah, and I think some of that that was blowback from the 80s because it got so over the top where the music got lost. You know, I'm not talking about showbiz. I'm talking about just the end, the essence of what makes gro- great rock and roll, you know, the the basics of it, of of playing together as a group and grooving yeah. and creating a pulse and a cadence and having a style. You know, Nirvana had a pulse and a style. They were a great band. Oh, yeah, and they were course. very original. You know, they were great. And so so they were great, but there's a lot of, you know, even recent, I, this heavy metal to me, it's just losing, you know, Motorhead, Motorhead had a little uh, substance in there if you yeah. really listen and you know a little bluesy stuff in there too which always makes the hard rock rock more and I that's kind of all i'm talking about. i guess just i like that style so when i hear rock to me all the greatest rock that stands up over a test of time always has that in it and when you're yeah. talking about you know even even nirvana it has a soulfulness to it and all those other 90s bands that we're not going to talk about probably don't true true that's kind of what i'm getting at yeah no and i agree with you 100 percent. you know what i mean um one of the other things so we're t- we talked about chuck berry i don't know if you know this and, and, and to, not to beat a dead horse but the only reason i get passionate about that is to me as if for a younger musician because i get asked all the time what do i do and what do i do and what do i do most people don't really want to hear the answers, but if you study the roots of of where you of where music come f- comes from and what your influences influences were, you're going to really have a basis. So if somebody's yeah. listening, do your homework. You know, investigate. I agree. I agree. Is, is basically the whole reason I get get off on that tangent. So pardon me. No, no, no. And, it, and it's and it, you're absolutely right, because I did that. You know, when I discovered Metallica and this and that, I always for some maybe it's me. I, I don't know. Maybe it's the nerd in me. But like, I always wanted to know what influenced them. You know what I mean? And then I would look back well, yes, and, sure. and, and listen to what they listen to. And then from there, I looked at what those bands listen to. You know, it's just a cycle because it's learning. Like you said, it's learning the roots of everything. Right, right. You know what I mean? Um, Absolutely. So I want to know, like, if you remember, if you know this story, we you talked also about one unsmanship. You know, like being on stage and giving it your all, like a hundred and fifty percent, right? Because you should be the best man on the stage. You know what I mean? Um, do you know the story of Jerry Lee Lewis and Chuck Berry? I, uh, 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 yeah. Uh, Take a guess. Do I know the story? I know. I know yeah. you should know this. How yeah. badass yeah. was that for Jerry Lee Lewis to light his piano on fire and say, hey, sure? I, I want you to top that. Follow that, killer. Right? Right? Yeah. Um, I mean, and, and and back, back like, you know, you had mentioned when I said there's no danger in rock. Yeah. I mean, that's danger. There, there's a competition there. Yeah. That was, and it's a healthy competition. competition. Absolutely. Not that they couldn't be friends. I'm sure they both respected each other. But when it came on that stage, we're going to battle each other. Yeah. You know what I mean? And that's that's good. And I bet those people had the best rock and roll experience of their lives because of that. Right. That's all I'm getting at is that you should want to kick the other person's ass. That doesn't mean they probably had the utmost respect for each other at the end of the day. But like you mentioned, right? You said those people in the crowd probably had the best experience, right? And that's isn't right. that what it's that's all right. about? Absolutely. And that's what those guys were all about. They were all about making those people go wild and having a great concert. Not, right. not them getting off on stage. They were aiming to please the audience. You know, I don't like when I do a gig and people go, oh, what a what a shitty crowd tonight. Well, I, I go, well, maybe didn't really, maybe we didn't do our job. Maybe we didn't put it over, you know, yeah, that it goes yeah. that way too. That's you know, true. That's true. sure there's off nights, but sometimes you have these off nights and you think it's not good. And maybe sometimes people are just watching the music or it's a different type. And then, then you'll hear somebody, Oh, I saw you. And that was the greatest gig I've ever seen in my life. So it's, yeah. it's all perception anyways. True, true. 
Um, I remember seeing you for the first time. It was with it was the Educated Horses tour. I remember oh, okay. with Rob Zombie, and because and that where did was, we play? You played at uh, well, it's gone through different names. I believe at the time when you guys played, it might have been the Comcast Center in Mansfield, Massachusetts. Oh, like a shed building. Okay, one of those. Yeah, okay. like an amphitheater. Was it with Godsmack? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yep. Got it. I know. I know the place now. I can. I can remember it. Yeah. And I thought like because. For me, I was always like, John Tempesta was like, holy shit, he was great. But then I saw you and the energy that you throw into it. I'm like, holy shit, who is this guy? You know what I mean? And, and that's yep. when I started doing more research about you. The comment you just said, holy shit, is this guy. Yeah. That's, that's what I'm after since I was a little kid. I always want people to go, holy shit, who is this guy? Right. I don't care if they know my name, but in fact, I prefer they don't know my name because I because <laughs> I've done a lot of gigs and, and they're still going, holy shit, who is this guy? Right. So to me, that's that's success to me right there. So I appreciate that. No, no problem. No problem. But it was true because it was like you were throwing so much energy into into the, you know, the drums and everything. I was like, man, this guy is like, I think he's rocking harder than than you know, zombie and John five, you know what I mean? Like, I was like, wow, where I come from, you're supposed to work hard. And I take pride in what I do. My dad works hard. My grandpa works hard. And I happen to be a musician. And I happen to play drums, but to me, it's my job. And it's still how, how you feel about yourself and what makes me a man is how I work, you True. know, and how I support my family. So I pride in that. Um, it doesn't matter if I'm having a bad day. It doesn't matter if something's going on at home or you're in a fight with somebody or I'm going to go on that stage and I'm going to clock in. I'm going to turn it on. So that's how it works with me. And do you ever get, because I know, I mean, a lot of times for you guys, you guys are on the road like a lot. Is there like, and I've always heard, you know, different stories from different bands where some bands are like, listen, it doesn't matter how many days we're on the road. I'm going to give it my all every single time. And then you hear other stories of other bands where it's like, oh, my God, like, you know, it's just another city, you know, whatever. Um, uh -huh. How do you how do you avoid like the tour fatigue? Maybe is what I'm trying to say. It's just what I said previously. It's how I look at it. It doesn't matter if you're tired and you have to conduct yourself a certain way. You know, when I get done with a gig, I go back in that hotel room and I shut the door and I use the time to rest to get ready for the performance. And mm -hmm. I take care of myself and everything's geared towards the performance, what I'm eating, how much rest I'm getting, where I'm going. I don't really hang out. So it takes a lot of energy up there, but, but you gotta, you know, it's a professional job and you're getting paid to do something. So you do to me, my life revolves around it besides my family. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's a job. So you either do it or you don't, you know, That's true. That's and, true. and over time, I, I feel, you know, over time, when you conduct yourself that way, the right things are going to work out because you've put in the work and people notice that. Yeah. And I've noticed that, you know what I mean? Like, that's why I'm Great. such a huge I, fan. And when I saw I this really opportunity, appreciate it. thank you for noticing. Yeah, definitely. Um, this is kind of a fun question because you've played with Nuge, you've played with Alice, you know, and obviously Ozzy now. Um, what was the feeling like for you when you step into the room for the first time and you've got to jam with these guys? It's always the same. I want to, sh I, I want them to go, I got to have this guy. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's, you know, it's, you know, you don't get a second opportunity all the time. So, you know, your life leads up to these, at least for me in my musical career, it's led up to certain moments to where you're, you're either going to fly or you're going to fall down. You yeah, know what I sink mean? Sink or swim. So, yeah. you know, it, exactly. I should have said that. Um, <laughs> That's all good. Um, um, but, you know, you don't really get second chances to me. So I better, I better have done my homework you know, everything you've done in your life, 
leads up to those moments. So, mm. you know, make it happen or you don't. So mm. I, I noticed those moments. It's not, you know, when I first got a break with Ted Nugent, I knew that was my, my kind of first way to get out of, you know, whatever was going on before I go, Oh, this is it. Get yeah. ready. You know? Yeah. But that took, that took 10, 12 years of hard work to get there. And then it took more work to get in the next thing and the more work to, you know, and yeah, each yeah. thing leads it. It's just like anything else. And again, if young musicians are, you know, I get asked all the time, oh, Joey wants to be a drummer, do blah, 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 blah. But then when you start telling them these kind of things, they kind of start walking away like you don't know what you're talking about. Well, because you're talking about hard work and you're talking about perseverance, they kind yeah. of want to hear that. Well, you got to network and go hang out and do this. And I and you're, you're like, going to be an overnight sensation, I get it, <laughs> or whatever, or he's doing so great. But it, yeah, you mean you mean it takes years, you know? It's it, it's a, and even if you get a, a little bit of success, it's still it's it gets becomes more difficult, you know. Well, and because I also think people don't understand the the amount of hard work you got to put in, because people automatically think they pick up a drum set, they're going to be rock stars tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah, and, and that's the other thing, what you just said, rock star. I'm not a rock star, nor did I ever set out to be one. You know, well, you're, I a, just, you're a musician. I'm a musician, but I'm just, I, but I'm not a famous one. And I never tried to be famous. You know, Ozzy's famous. I just play for famous people is the yeah. goal. You know, there's, all, you know, um, and, and it's two different things. I never got in it into it to be a rock star. I just wanted to play drums and be the best that I can be now that being said it's become my career and I support my family through that and that's an amazing thing to get just to be blessed to enjoy what you get to do to support your family not everybody sure. is allowed that most sure. people got to go to work they got to drive an hour they hate their job they they don't get out to live out their dreams you know they got to you know whatever you know and and I can't lose sight of that yeah, just reminded yeah. myself that, by the way. <laughs> um, so my friend, so I took like kind of a fan question. Uh, this is from Julian Murgard from Texas. He wants to know, he says, such huge shoes to fill with Sabbath and Ozzy. How do you view the interpretation of that material versus playing it as the original drummers did? Do you feel the songs have a right and wrong way to be played? Uh, everything has a right and wrong way to be played. So I just use my musical ears and my musical heart to guide me and tell yeah. me what, you know, I, I never play anything even on my own record that I feel is playing out of trying to be a hot shot. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So if that comes into play, I, I mean, I just don't go there. I don't need uh, to go there. And I think if you're that kind of guy, real guys, they notice that. So I think the Sabbath guys respected me in my approach to their music. And I think I respected Bill Ward's parts. And But at the same time, when I go on stage, people feel my energy and they feel my passion. And there's my, there's my stamp on it, if you will, without changing yeah. anything. Okay. Yeah, I think that it was kind of one of those things you always wonder when you get into another band, it's like, do they give you any, not so much creative freedom, but like, kind of like, uh, you know, hey, we get you have to play this song this way, but maybe you can add, you know, your flair to it. Yeah, put it this way, when, when you're dealing with good people, there's much less talk about it. True. Okay. So... It's, le it's left up to me to, to not have, have them to have to say anything. Okay. So if they don't say anything, I'm probably doing what they want to hear. Yeah, you know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. So that's, that's the goal, you know? Yeah, definitely. It either feels right or it doesn't feel right. When it doesn't feel right, then they start, well, you know, what, what are you doing on your heart? What are you doing here? And, and it becomes an issue. You know, yeah, so if nobody's yeah. saying anything and you see smiles and you've got through two tours with somebody, then it's probably you're probably doing what you want. Definitely. But that but that comes from years and years of doing it. And you have to be selfless with yourself. I see 
you know, there's so much YouTube and Instagram musicians out there. Oh. And what's their focus? What's their focus? Making a video for the day. And how yeah. do they feel that they're going to get attention? Um, they're going to play a lot of notes and play a solo or do this or whatever. You know, think Tony Iommi wrote Iron Man. Think of technically how simple is that song? It's, it's a monumental riff, but, but, and then compared to what these other guys are doing. So who wins? See what I'm saying? Yeah, no, I definitely do. I definitely do. Um, so when, when we're allowed to go back to concerts, right. And, and we can have shows with full capacities. What are the chances of Tommy's rock trip going on tour? Hey, like you said, there's a song on my album called You Got the Cash and I Got the Flash. That's to <laughs> sum it up. Right, so, right. I mean, if there's, if there's an opportunity and somebody has electricity, I'll come in, plug in and play. Nice, nice. Hey, how did you, how did you feel about singing on the record? Like, how, how was that for you? I never set out to sing on the album. It, it just kind of happened by happenstance. And... I initially did what's called scratch vocals on the album. Okay. So Eric Dover could kind of learn the melodies and the lyrics and stuff. And those, those songs that you hear me singing, which maybe is more of a squawking, um, were just initially scratch vocals that I kind of go, you know what? It doesn't sound that bad and it's not making me want to puke. So let's just, let's just leave it. And, and those song, a couple of those songs were kind of personal. One was, one was called "Make Me Smile," which was about my Lovely. beautiful wife, because um, okay. I'm not good. I'm not good at writing love poems or Valentine's Day cards, so I wrote her a rock and roll, bluesy rock song. So I yeah. had to sing that. I had to sing that one. Okay. And then the last song on there is called "The Power of Three, which is about my is for my daughter. Um, so I had to sing that. A daddy had to sing her her song. So that's kind of why that ended up happening. Okay. And I almost didn't care if my voice sounded bad. I had to sing those songs because it was my my musical gift to the two most important people in my life. Well, believe me, you did an awesome job. Hey, thanks so much. Yeah, but I'm no definitely problem. not a singer. Put it that way. Oh, yeah. Hey, you know, no. it's okay. Um, oh, you're supposed to say, of course you are. It sounded Well, great. you are. No, no, no. I know. No. I know, right? Uh, what is your proudest moment, you would say? as a musician? I, I don't, I, I can never answer these questions because I've always worked hard and I've always given it my all. So each step of the way, when I first played in my dad's band and set up my drums and there was one stage light shining on my cymbals, I felt proud. You know, mm -hmm. when I finished the last song, I felt proud. When I played... You know, when I was playing corner bars, I was proud because I was doing a good job. Yeah. Then when I got my next band, I was doing a good job. Then somebody else hired me and I was proud. And I'm, I'm, I'm very proud of what I, I've done, but I don't live in the past because everything ends and there's always something new to go to, you know, and, yeah. and you can always get better. And, and I always keep pushing and, you know, but I'm very proud of everything as a whole, you know. Yeah. And music has taught me so much about life and, and how to be and how to persevere and, and keep pushing. And, and if you're a good person and work hard, it usually works out in the end. As cheesy as that sounds, if you dedicate yourself to something, you'll learn these invaluable lessons that some people have to read books about. Yeah, yeah, true. Very true. Um, all right. So last question. Okay. Gene Simmons has said plenty of times that he feels that rock is dead. Do you agree with what he's saying? What are your thoughts about it? Rock and roll will never die. It's, it's, it's a true American art form. So, and I don't think he means it's literally dead, that it doesn't exist. I think he means as a business model, yeah. it's kind of, it ain't happening right now because people don't buy the product. And, and I, I, would, I won't say rock is dead, but I would, if, he, if that was his take on it, I would tend to agree with him because in the 70s when rock was king, people bought albums, they supported the concerts, they went. Yeah. Now there's no album sales. So, so if there's not a financial 
reward at the end of the tunnel, why would Bam put years and years and years of work to to do anything? You know, you used to have you used to have four or five album deals. You know, I don't know too much about this stuff, but you hear you had you had years with that with a record label. They they put time and effort into it. Now it's like they give you a two months and and if you don't have something then it yeah. moves on think of all the great bands you know fleetwood mac was around a long time before oh. rumors hit you know yeah, i know and then and then the big payout is there you know yeah yep. no i agree so Lindsay Buckingham. i think that's what he means is the infrastructure is has been totally demolished unless you're already an existing successful band True, and that's true. what he's talking about, I believe. A young band, there's not much, too much financial goal at the end of the rainbow. And music, yeah. it's a wonderful thing, and we all love it. But once you get past 18 and you don't want to live in your parents' basement, you got to start thinking about paying the bills. Yeah, that's true. That's and you true. can't dedicate your whole life to music unless you make money at it. Yeah, you know? no, I agree. And that's and the thing. I think and people lose... People lose sight of that. Like a guy like me, I'm a, I'm a working musician. I yeah. need to work to make money. It's not like, oh, you play for Black Sabbath and you're in Black Sabbath. It doesn't work that way, you know? Yeah, yeah. I didn't write Paranoid. Yeah, I know, I know. Um, yeah, because, you know, and the thing too is like like you were saying, the business models, because the the internet and, and these downloading sites are kind of what killed the music industry. In, in that aspect, the business aspect. Not kind of it. It's what's done it. You know, there's yeah. no physical product. Even, even you know, even a, an online thing, they just, you know, it's literally, I'm sure my album is right on YouTube. You, can, you don't have to buy it, you know? Yeah, which is unfortunate because so, I love holding, you know, an album in my yeah, hands. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I hope it'll come back a little. There's a little bit of this vinyl insurgence but yeah, you know, for the yeah, most yeah. part a, four, a 14 year old kid's just going to go on their phone and like you know listen to one track and that's it so we shall see but it ain't ever going to go away the one good thing is the live thing you can't manufacture that so that people will true. always go see concerts and i think when things open up that they're really going to come out in droves because it's been taken away from them and people need that in their lives. So I can't wait to get back out there. I can't wait to play music and rock people's faces off. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk today. I really yeah, appreciate definitely. it. And, and hopefully we'll be around your town and we'll get to say hello. Heck yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Eddie. I'm all my best to you.